Hello, I'm Kath from Quarr Street and I'm joined down there, I think maybe by my colleague Anne Breen. Thanks very much for, um, for watching today. Um, we're going to talk to you all about Person First, which is a methodology that we developed um, over the last, well, how long was it Anne Breen? Uh, I think we've been probably working on it for the last couple of years last couple of years and it was inspired by a project that we did five years ago that we're going to tell everybody about so I guess the background to this really is what we love about doing uh, qualitative research which is that we as qualies are able to dig deeper and shine a light on what it's like to be a particular type of person and I guess our thing particularly at Call Street is about really understanding people's lived experience but of course, there are always constraints about how deep we can go. Sometimes that's around time. So our clients need stuff done quickly. And always there's going to be a money constraint on the project that we're doing in some way or another. Um, and that really leads all qualitative researchers in one way or another to come up with method methodologies that are almost in units. So rather than just say, oh, we'll go off and explore, we always end up saying, oh, we'll do X number of groups or X number of depth interviews, whether they're online or whether they're in person. Um, and we often say, oh, well, we'll do it for, you know, an hour and a half or two hours. And we have to really guess at how long the research is going to be. In other words, we're predetermining the research before we've even met our participants. And therefore, what we're doing never takes into account how people prefer to communicate because we're really yet to meet them. And typically in the research that we do, it's a bit frustrating because there's never really enough time for people to fully express themselves. And I guess there's always that thought that we don't yet know what we could explore about them. And it's only in the moment when we're with them there that we can actually find out the good stuff, the, the juice that they've got for us. We also think that the way that typically research, qualitative research is done, therefore sort of tends to lead to a bias in the types of people that we talk to, because we tend towards people who fit the process, tall flowers. So people that are chatty, articulate, reliable, easy to understand. And we can visualize who those people are, often female because they like talking, often middle class, often very confident. It, and it might also be that they're just available at a particular time of day or an evening when we're doing, doing the prescribed field work in a prescribed way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they might just be living in a place that's easy for us to get to, all of that kind of stuff. And I guess from our perspective, that also has implications, therefore, for diversity and inclusion. But we think that we can do better now. And really, there are probably three reasons why we can or why we ought to. One is that technology is letting us do research in all sorts of new and different ways, which is fantastic. Also, we're being required by our clients and we require of ourselves to really think about diversity and inclusion, which is, you know, about time too. And there's been a shift and the shift is a really positive one from seeing participants as human beings rather than as consumers. And that means we can kind of put them more at the center um, of the world of research. And because of all of that, we can move away from this research by units and start to think about what we hope are new and improved ways of doing qualitative research. So what we'd like to tell you about in this presentation is our, what we hope we can claim to be, new and improved version of qualitative research at Quall Street that we think really does dig deeper and gets further. We've called it person first, and we hope that the clue is in the, is in the, of the name is in the title and all of that kind of stuff, not always easy to pronounce, but at least it's telling us we're putting the person first in all of the project that we do. So I'm hoping that by now you're thinking, well, what is person first? What is that? Um, and I, I think the most important thing to take away is that it's about co-producing with participants how we do the research. So it's not about the researcher dictating it all. It's about getting together with somebody and figuring out how they want to do it and what the best way is to produce the results. So it's a bit of a you do you approach. It might be you love chatting and we'll try and design the research so that you get to chat loads. It might be that we talk to you in email because that's how you like to do things or texting. Or it might be better for the research and for you if we hang out with you whilst you're, you're shopping. Or it might be all of those things at different times of the day. So how did person first all begin? And I guess it 
began because we realized um, over the course of a project that we were doing that was self-funded that our participants like to do things differently. So Amber and myself, when was it Amber? Um, it was in 2017, Kath, so nearly five years ago that we My did goodness. this, wasn't it? it? It feels fre fresh as a daisy, doesn't it? But we did a year long project, which is a massive privilege for, um, for, for qualitative researchers because it allowed us to really dig in. And we wanted to explore the lives of nine women and all of them had something in common, which is that they were just about managing, um, just about managing with money. Um, and the reason we got to spend a year with them is because we self-funded the project so we could do it any way we liked. And one of our objectives was to learn more about how to do research well. So we really wanted to understand them, but we really wanted to get better as researchers. And one of the things we found that I've already alluded to was that all of the participants liked to contribute in different ways and that we got more out of them when we let them do things in their own style. So Mel, who was one of the ladies that you got to know, um, Amber, she was a real dynamo. We ended up giving everybody kind of um, sort of uh, names that, that really expressed their personality. And Mel was a real dynamo. And she really liked to editorialise, didn't she? It was all like she drove what she wanted to tell you about. You might have had a set of objectives that you were trying to get her to answer. She was having none of that. But she was amazing at telling you what was on her mind and what mattered to her is is that right? Is that fair? Yeah, that's definitely right. So Mel sort of dipped in and out of the uh, process. We couldn't quite sort of pin her down at times, but it did feel like she wanted to drive what she wanted to tell us and how she wanted to, to um, and how she wanted to tell us as well. Um, and that was very much part of her personality and how she wanted to present and curate her life in some ways. Perfect. And that's what gave us the in, in inspiration for for person first we realized if we put the person at the center of the research we'd get more out so dawn was another one of our lovely uh, respondents and she really liked to go on the online community that we had set up for the nine women um and uh this is alexandra and she liked to do voice notes where she was basically she spent about an hour every week complaining about her husband essentially so all of that was the inspiration for pe for person for person first but of course, we didn't have money or time constraints with um, with you in the life because it was our money and our time. And, you know, we, we sort of gave that as much as we wanted to. But in real life, real projects, there are money and time constraints. So we need to throw that into the pot when we were thinking about person first and how we would do it. And one of the ways that we are trying to kind of manage um, the time and the money constraint is by handpicking a small number of participants and thinking very carefully about diversity and inclusion. So this is a food project that we did and we were really careful to represent different types of people in terms of their eating and cooking styles and the different needs that they had and different backgrounds that they came from. So really one of the things that we do in person third first is we go really deep, but we don't go broad. So we say, okay, we're gonna limit the number of people. We'll probably try to get away with the minimum number of participants, but with those minimum people, we will spend the maximum amount of time with them. So if you've got 10 people in a project, you'll be you know, getting eight hours worth of uh, inputs from them, which is 80 hours worth of in insight. So we, we do really go deep. The other thing sort of to manage the time constraint is that we have developed a process. So we typically field work lasts a couple of weeks, but within that we have a bit of a process to guide people through what we want. It starts off with a Zoom launch sometimes, telling everybody who's participating what we want to get out of the project. Um, and then we do the very important establishing interview that I'm gonna tell you about, and then they go off and do their own thing. So yeah, the Zoom briefing is really, and this goes back to that technology thought that we can pull everybody in who's gonna be doing the project and tell them what our objectives are and give them a bit of information about how the project will work and, and how it's different from usual market research. Um, sorry, my, my screen's just got a little bit stuck there. Let's see whether I can uh, move it on. So for example, we, at this Zoom briefing, we help them to understand their commitment. So we might say, okay, the project's gonna be lasting for two weeks. We're gonna be asking you to spend between four and eight hours, for example, and you'll get this amount of money. So they can already understand that it's a flexible thing that we're asking. 
And then comes the absolute critical bit of the project, which is the establishing interview. And this is where we get to meet them, sometimes on the phone, sometimes on Zoom, sometimes in person. And we spend about an hour, maybe more, getting to know them from their perspective and trying to understand how they can tap in to help us with the objectives of our research project. So it might be if it's a food project that they are um, particularly interesting when it comes to how they plan their meals. And we might wanna spend more time with them doing that. And then we might want to link in with them how they do their shopping in relation to their meal planning. Or it might be that they have a particular eating style and that we want to talk to them about that. So the establishing interview is where we find out what's interesting about that person, number one, and also how they want to do the research. Do they want to chat to us in short bursts on the phone? Do they want us to come shopping with you, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all about you do you. It's about pulling on a thread, following clues, and using this flexible approach to explore what comes up. So typically we have done on our first person first, not easy to pronounce, that, that was a mistake, person first uh, projects, shopping tasks, diary tasks, product trials, deep dive observations, Zoom um, either in, uh, and in-person conversations. We've pulled everybody together in a group. So we've done WhatsApp conversations and, and uh, group conversations as well. It basically, you can apply any methodology that you want to person first. The other thing that's really important is that the researcher has to commit to analyzing as they go. So you can't wait to the end of eight groups and then listen back. You actually have to be thinking about this project as it goes. And that means that, you know, you need to be a really good team. So you also need to talk to your co-researcher. So, Amber, when we've done research, we are on the phone to each other, aren't we? And we're comparing notes with who said what across our interviews to see that we're meeting the client's objectives. Yeah, and it's it's about sort of share, sharing those early insights or clues that we're getting as we go along to um, help develop and build our thinking so that um, we're getting the clues from our own participant as well as the clues from each other participants as we yeah, go. Yeah, and sharing our theories feels really important. All of this works because of technology. We can use Zoom, WhatsApp, and then we can use online communities as well in their various uh, forms. So here are examples of some of the ones we like, but there are also now free research tools, which makes that, go back to that budget constraint, it makes it feasible and affordable. So we love insight platforms because it allows you to kind of noodle around and see what free, um, free help that you can get um, as part of the research process. And what we found is that the outputs from this process, it is worth it because we are able to give clients loads of material, loads of stuff that brings them closer to the people that we're researching. So it feels like there's closeness and intimacy, but there's also deeper insight. And it has allowed us to come up with some quite profound, well, profound, that's so we say, but we do think it is profound ideas around the way people behave and the way that people, the way that people are. And we've been able to apply some of those across different projects. The insight has been kind of true enough that it's about life as opposed to just about one specific thing. Just to finish up on then, I'd like to just explore the upsides and the downsides of person first, because it's not for everything. So let's have a think about what it's for. So in terms of its overriding upside, it's about, as I've said, putting the participant at the heart of the process. And they love it. They say to us, I felt seen, I felt understood, I felt heard. So it is a positive experience for them. It is also really great for discovering what you don't know, you don't know, which is always the goal in, in qual. And it's a kind of big qual where you get hours of material and insight touch points to sift through, to deliver really profound insight. And it can keep on giving because of that. It also can take a really 360 degree approach. So if you're doing a food project, it would help you explore shopping, cooking, eating, and the relationship between the three. Or if you were looking at money, you could look at saving, planning, and spending and how they all interrelate to each other. And it, you can explore both the individual dynamic or the individual insight and group dynamics. So there's loads of different ways to pull people's family members into the conversation, for example, or to talk to the whole cohort that you're researching through groups and WhatsApp chats and all of that kind of stuff. 
There is a downside though, it is pretty intense. So from the researchers point of view and the participants point of view, they can become quite attached to the researcher because of the amount of contact and the amount of attention that they're getting from the researcher. And also there is this fluidity because we're negotiating the project as it goes along. So researchers absolutely have to set and police um, the boundaries of the research because of this sort of cha changing nature as it goes along. You also have to be quite brave. So the cost per participant can be quite high. So for example, you might have 10 people in your project, but you might be spending 30,000 pounds on the project because we're spending so much time with them. And also you have to trust the process and believe that insight will emerge and you don't necessarily what's, know what's gonna come out um, until you've done it. And that is moving away from that unit approach and just saying, I'm gonna get insight. It is for specific projects and not every project. So it feels like when you need to understand the lived experience in an expansive way, what it's like to snack or manage money or be a particular type of person, that's when person first works really well. And what we love doing it because it allows us to truly get participants it feels really authentic so we can go along to clients and say we know them we know this we've understood it it allows all of us to, to look at no stone unturned and we know that our clients love it too so it does really help um, because we have all of these inputs and great materials it really helps the client um, bring to life their problem their issue and their and the people that buy their products so lovely quote from one of our clients that used the um, used the approach and i think that's it so amber have i missed anything out would you like to add anything no i think you've done a great job kath thanks amber <laughs> Um, okay, so let's open it up to questions and thank you very much, everybody.